Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Hillsborough United Methodist Church. It is a joy to have you with us in worship this morning as we gather on this sort of the, the last in the, in the sequence of the season of Christmas. We're kind of in an interstitial state between Christmas being over, but the new seasons of the church not quite being here yet. And on this day, we commemorate and celebrate the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember a few weeks ago, I was talking about the, the time jump that we experience between Christmas and uh, just a few weeks in the life of the church as we read through Holy Scripture together. We go from Jesus as an infant uh, in the manger, and a few weeks later, he's 30 years old, and we have arrived on that date as we remember Jesus' baptism at around the age of 30 in the River Jordan uh, by John the Baptist. And so today, as part of that commemoration, we too will remember our own baptisms, and through uh, our communal worship together, we will uh, recommit uh, ourselves to the vows that we took, or maybe someone else took on our behalves when we were baptized, to remember the way that God continues to call us and send us and love us through all of the work of the church. A few announcements as we begin this morning. Uh, one is that uh, I'm flying solo again this morning. Uh, I would invite your prayers for Lori and David Yoder. They both have had bronchitis since almost the first of the year. And uh, David could barely get enough words out on the phone to tell me what was going on. So I invite you to hold him and Lori in your prayers. And uh, just in this season in which we continue to uh, watch the COVID variants move through our communities and our loved ones, to watch the way that it affects uh, elective surgeries and repairs and, and affects the availability of emergency rooms across the country, to just the normal stuff that runs around this time of year, flu and bronchitis and the common cold and, and every pastor's disease that hits us immediately after Christmas happens called exhaustion. And um, that, that was a joke, by the way. Um, just the way that we are continued to call by God to look out for each other, to pause and to take the precautions, even if it's just washing our hands a little extra, uh, to care for our families and the people that we love. Thank you for all you do to keep each other safe. Uh, we have got Youth Group and Kids Club back again today. Uh, youth Group, we are uh, doing some painting in the main room with uh, the help of Sherry Sisk uh, helping us out, and we are also assembling snack packs uh, for our youth who will, or through the children of our community who will be on break for Martin Luther King Day. And uh, we'll be sending snack packs with them, uh, which is a joy to do as well. Any other announcements as we begin worship? Then, as part of this service in which we recommit ourselves to the way in which God's love has called us, our opening prayer this morning comes from uh, John Wesley, who every year wrote a prayer uh, that was about remembering the way in which God calls us to recommit ourselves daily. And we call this the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's a great prayer. It's also 300 plus years old and sometimes doesn't really ring as uh, accurate to our modern life. And so with the help of several of my colleagues a few years ago, I adapted the prayer, if you will, so it sounds a little bit more like was written 50 years ago rather than 300 years ago. So as we are in prayer this morning, as we begin to center our hearts and minds on God, whose love for us was at the very beginning of time, I invite you to pray with me through this adapted version of the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. I pause this day, O oh God, to cast off the idea that I am my own self-made self-reliant creation. In truth, O oh God, you have claim on me. I am yours. Make me into what you want. Place me with whom you want. Guide my steps, whatever the path ahead might bring. Whether I am put to work or put aside, 
Whether I am lifted high or brought down low, whether I am full or empty, whether I have all things or have nothing, I give all that I have and all that I am for you, so be it. And may you, blessed and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, receive what I have spoken with my lips. Write it, I pray, upon my heart, and hold me close forever, I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with me and join in our opening hymn, This is the Spirit's Entry Now. invite you to be seated. It was on my list to uh, mention as I was mentioning the health of David Yoder, but our sign up for our liturgists is on the back table there as you exit. If you would like to uh, fill in some of those gaps here in the beginning of the year, uh, I am assuming at this point that it's not some sort of guarantee that you're going to get sick. So uh, you think you can... <laughs> Perfect cough, Marie. Thank you. Um, thank you for all those who have volunteered their time and energy in the ways that we lead our worship and uh, listen to the ways in which God might be calling you to help out. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the 43rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Listen with me for the word of the Lord. But now, says the Lord, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel, don't fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. The flames, or you won't be scorched and the flames won't burn you. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Because you are precious in my eyes, you are honored and I love you. I give people in your place and nations in exchange for your life. Don't fear. I am with you. From the east, I'll bring your children. From the west, I'll gather you. I'll say to the north, give them back. And to the south, don't detain them. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who was called by my name and whom I created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the evangelist Luke. I invite you to stand and lift up your hearts as we hear the gospel. Now as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, grant that these words that we share and these thoughts that we hold, may they be good and useful and acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, you are our rock, and you are our strength, and you are our Redeemer. Amen. When the world speaks to us, from the time that we are very young to the times that we finally depart from this mortal life, the world's message is entirely consistent. Earn your way, the world says. Prove your worth. You want to play on the team? You got to fight for your position. You want to be at the top of the company's uh, structural ladder? Well, you got to earn your way there. You want to teach the class that you want to teach and you want to be in the school you want to? Well, it's going to take work because we're not going to accept you on credit, friend, the world says. The world says instead, we're going to assume the worst and you will have to prove us wrong. I remember when uh, my parents went to sign my twin brother and I up for baseball. And let me just say, I was not at the beginning overly interested in baseball, nor was I particularly athletically gifted. I discovered six years later that maybe glasses would have helped me see the ball as it was coming towards me, and maybe then I might have actually been able to hit the ball instead of what I did, which was praying to be walked every single time. Amazing how corrective lenses might have improved my, my batting average. But what I remember is the coach who gathered us all together, and I think with a very accurate read, looked at me and said, right field. I had never played baseball in any sort of organized way, and, and it made sense now looking at it. Well, where do you stick someone who doesn't know how to play baseball in little league terms? The outfield. Doesn't really matter which position. I think I sort of moved between left and right and center field over my first year or two or maybe three, I don't remember. What I can remember is that feeling of stuckness in that great green expanse. And the, when I wasn't focused on how my, uh, my baseball glove really made an excellent air guitar, I think I remember standing out there in the middle of the field thinking, what is it going to take to get in, to play in the position I want to play in? What is it going to take for me to show that I'm good enough to be up there? Because it's lonely. It's lonely out in left field. It's lonely out where you think you've been stuck because the person in charge doesn't see the value that you can bring to the table. And I fought, I earned my way to my third base position, and I was, I mean, mediocre. But in my mind, I was pretty darn good. And that more than that, I felt proud. And as we moved through school, those, that experience of feeling at times stuck out in the middle of left field, and at other times feeling like we've made it, and we've succeeded, and that we fought our way to where we want to be, that's the story of life, school, work, Love, friendship, you got to earn your way. But we pause, we pause here in this place. We pause as we remember the way in which God's love precedes us 
by quite a significant amount. I mean, at the very basics of it, God's love precedes you by about 2,000 years through the mercy of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ himself, the word of God, who was with the Father at the very beginning of all things, tells me that God's love has been around a lot longer than me. And so when we read these words from the Gospel of Luke, and we see the baptism of Jesus, it reminds me of what baptism truly stands for. That baptism is a mighty reversal of the message of the world. The world that says, prove your worth and earn your way. When we come and we are baptized, when we are welcomed into the entrance and entranced into the life of the church, it is not because we are worthy. It is not because we have proven anything. It's because for all of our seeking, we discover that God was searching for us a lot longer before we started. We remember that in the simplicity of water, we find a symbol to show us that we can be renewed, born again, and in that new birth, which is not born from our cleverness or our strength or our wisdom or our canniness. But that new birth, which comes from the love of God, gives us a different viewpoint on life. That no matter how we move through the world, no matter how all the fights that we have to move through in order to show that we are worthy in the world, that we must remember that when we come back into this place, when we gather again with our family, we must be prepared to leave that message from the world at the door. Because in this space, the word is not prove yourself but rather accept your worthiness that God is already giving you. When Jesus is baptized and he comes out of the water and is praying, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit, the, the, uh, Luke tells us, descends upon him in bodily form as a dove and then a voice. This is my son, the beloved in whom I am well pleased. And my sisters and brothers, I am here this morning to remind you that no matter when it was, no matter whether you were a few days old or a year old or seven or eight years old or 30 years old or 60 years old, no matter when it is that we are baptized, that God speaks those same words to you. God says, you are mine. I love you. I'm pleased. In all the times that we feel lost, in all the times that we feel, can feel stuck out in left field in the world of life, God says, you are mine. I love you. I'm pleased with nothing to prove except the willingness to let our, us choose Jesus and in that choosing allow God to rewrite our priorities and our imaginations to lay aside all of our fears and anxieties at the doorstep and allow that the love of God might transform us into something new. After all, baptism isn't proof that we've arrived at any particularly high spiritual point, but baptism is the reminder that why should we have to search for that which has existed from the very beginning of time? 
And yet, baptism is something we can remember each and every morning. That was, uh, Charlie, we were talking about Martin Luther, or Lutheranism just a minute ago. That was Martin Luther's favorite spiritual practice, was every morning dousing his head with water and saying, Martin, you are a beloved child of God. Or he would have said, a baptized child of God. It's a worthy thing, and, and I, I encourage you to try it. It's one of my favorites, too. Before you jump into the shower each morning, take a handful of water and just splash it on your head or face and just say to yourself, I am a beloved son or daughter of God. And just let that sit there for a moment to remind you that through all the other things that you will face that day, that you started it on the right note, that you started the day remembering that your worthiness cannot be taken away from you and that God's love will never depart from you. How can we lose something which has no end? Through all the other voices and challenges, hear God's word. You are mine. I love you. I'm pleased. Amen. Our time of prayer this morning. There are several notes that I wish to make for us as a community. One is that I received an email from Charlotte Takahashi yesterday that, uh, that uh, updating me on how Heroes cancer treatments in Japan have been progressing, and the news was not good. Uh, the last several treatments that he's been through, which have been pretty strong treatments, have not yielded the results that the doctors have wanted. And so she fears that they are coming to an end of time at which the treatments will be effective in prolonging Hero's life. Their hope is to be able to return here to Hillsborough before that occurs, and I will keep you updated as I know more. But I encourage you with all that I have to hold Hero and Charlotte in your prayers and to keep the prayers going for his doctors and for his health that... Um, in all of that, that all that can be done will be done. I would also like to add to our prayers a request from one of our youth, uh, Olivia uh, Hefley's cousin Cooper, who's in the hospital and has already undergone several surgeries and may have to undergo more. Please hold Cooper in your prayers. Are there other joys or concerns that you would add for us this morning? then I invite you to be in prayer with me. Gracious and heavenly God, you, you who formed all things, you who have loved us from the very beginning, from when you created all that we see and know and are. You have named us and loved us, and by the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have saved us. We lift to you this morning our prayers and praise. Oh, we lift to you the strength of our minds and bodies and spirits. We lift to you our hands, that in praising you, you may send us forth to serve one another in love. God, we give you thanks for the gift of water for its refreshment, for its renewal, and for the way in which it reminds us of your never-ending love for each one of us. Help us to hold fast to our own baptisms as we seek to serve you in this life. We pray for those who are sick and ill in mind or body or spirit, we especially hold within our hearts Cooper and Hero that you, O oh God, would surround them and that by your presence and your powerful Holy Spirit that you would offer your comfort and healing, your guidance and your strength. Your love for us, O oh God, has, never, never, has no beginning and no end. Extend to us, O oh God, 
your strength, your courage, your love. Look across your world, O God, and see where there are those who are suffering, where there are those who live in places of warfare or hatred or injustice and pain, where natural disaster or man-made destruction reduce the lives of one another to mere survival. By your Holy Spirit, O God, call us again out of survival and into thriving in your mercy. All that we are is yours, and all that we seek to be is your servant. Take these prayers, even the ones that we cannot speak aloud. Hear us, answer us, and love us by the mercy of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. In celebration of all of the gifts that God has granted to us, I invite you to stand with me and join in our doxology. I invite you to remain standing with me for a moment and either turn in your bulletins or look on the screen above for our words as we celebrate this Thanksgiving over the waters. My sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land you promised. Sing to God, all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare God's work to the nations, God's glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit and by this gift of water call to our remembrance the grace declared to us at our baptism. For you have washed away our sins, and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that by dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal creator, through Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew this morning the covenant declared at our baptisms. Acknowledge what God is doing for us now and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world, and repent of your sin? I renounce them. That's good. All right, we'll be on good for the next one. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord. In union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Yes, I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, answer, I will. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My sisters and brothers, generally, when we remember our baptisms, since in the Methodist Church we believe that baptism is a work of God and therefore never needs to be repeated because God did not get it wrong when God claimed you and loved you, but we do remember our baptism with water. And so normally, when we do that, everyone would come and have a moment around the font, and you could play in it and splash a little bit. And I thought to myself, this doesn't feel very COVID compliant. Everyone with your hands in various states of cleanliness, no offense. Everyone with coughs and all the other illnesses going around. So after some thought, I decided, hey, I've got all these communion cups. We can put water in those. And we have enough spaces in the room that everyone can go to whichever station. There's two behind you and two in front of you. You can take a little bit of water, maybe splash your partner with it a little bit, play around with it. Maybe the best way to remember your baptism is to simply touch the water. And what I prefer is to touch the water and make the sign of the cross on my own forehead. To remember that each and every day, each and every day, God's love for you is there before you wake up. It's there before you have your very first thought about why the alarm clock is going off so early. It's there before you even close your eyes at night. And it's there long after. God's love for us not only gives us new birth, but it challenges us. As we uh, declared in our statements, uh, in, the, in our vows of baptism, our baptism commits us to opposing evil and injustice. It reminds us that all around us are messages that are contrary to the love of God. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of selfishness and cruelty in the world to remind ourselves that we belong not to ourselves but to God is to remind ourselves that we are tasked with a holy mission, that in all the places where God's love is dimmed by the cruelty of humanity, that we are tasked to bring the light of Christ by our words by our actions, by our presence. So however it is that you will find it useful to remember, I invite you to, at, uh, when the music begins, find whichever station is closest or farthest away, depending on how you want. Uh, and if you would like to use the center font, that is an option to you as well. Take some water, spend some time with it but mostly spend time in prayer, that the renewal of who we are in God's love 
might grant us vision and hope for a new year filled with the love of Jesus Christ. I invite you to come and remember that you are loved and that you belong to God and that God is pleased with you. Come and remember. My sisters and brothers, remember your baptism and be thankful. My sisters and brothers, remember your baptism and be thankful. My sisters and brothers, remember your baptism and be thankful. Oh, you thought we were done. My sisters, this, uh, that, I wasn't critiquing your responses. My, my plan is always to have this continue on for a minute. My sisters and brothers, remember your baptism and be thankful. Thanks be to God. You're lucky I don't have the whole picture with me. <laughs> Gracious God, at the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Grant that all who have been baptized into his name may keep the covenant that they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior. Amen. Our closing hymn is Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters, and I invite you to stand with me and sing to God.
It was just a, a few short weeks ago when uh, I was absent from you because we were taking John back to the congregation where I was baptized and where my wife and I were both confirmed. And let me tell you, there's something glorious in seeing your child baptized. There's something that unlocks within you to realize that God's love for that child preceded the universe itself. And there's something holy about knowing that God feels the same way about you. That God's love for you is just as strong and eternal. So may you go forth this week remembering all that you have been called to and all the value that God has given to you by the mercy of Jesus Christ. May you go and serve God and go in peace. Amen.